Now, last week, we began a series of lessons that will hopefully be instructing those who are following along with us in the fine art of rhetoric, a very underappreciated form of education. And this, of course, is in regards to conversation and critical thinking being one and the same. Right. Now, if you want to listen to our introduction, we have the clipped video available on our YouTube, Facebook, and our website pages, and you can engage with us through those through the rhetoric classes in 101. But noting the lessons must begin somewhere, of course, when we're talking to people, there is two parties in any conversation at minimum. And of course, if you're going to effectively speak to someone, what not only in the laws of rhetoric, but especially biblically, is required of those to have a meaningful conversation. Yeah, so the the main and first lesson that we can probably teach you guys and one that we are always trying to learn is the capacity to listen. So in James James 1, verse 18, it says, let everyone be uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. So before I learn how to speak correctly, I have to listen. I have to learn how to listen correctly. I have to learn how to hear what my opponent or what the person I'm trying to dialogue with is trying to say. And so, obviously, this doesn't mean oh well, if you have a hearing aid that uh, can just be adjusted. No, there are people who can hear just fine but don't listen, and right. that's the difference. Right, and it's cool. In the Greek, actually, there are multiple tenses that describe the act of listening. There are passive tenses and there are active tenses. So uh, the passive tense just means that you hear sounds, but an active tense means that you're defining meaning and content. So a good example of this is actually in Paul's conversion on the road to Damascus, where he sees a light and he hears Jesus speak to him. Now, it says in his conversion account that the people accompanying him heard the voice as well, but to them it just sounded like noise, right? They actually didn't discern any intent or they didn't discern any information from what Jesus was communicating to Paul. Only Paul heard that. That would be the very clear distinction between active and passive listening. Both are privy to the noises, but one is actually able to make out what the noises mean and interpret it for their life. So in order to be good at rhetoric, and remember, rhetoric is the art form of public speaking. That's your ability to convince other people using a platform where you're dialoguing with them in a speech uh, platform. So uh, to, to be distinguished from dialectic, in which I am trying to convince you using a conversational form. So that would be asking questions, hearing your response, and things like that. So in order to be a good rhetorician, in order to be someone who can speak well, I have to be able to listen to other people speak and do it with my brain turned on. Unfortunately, a lot of times when we listen to people speak, we turn our brains off and we just kind of listen to what they're saying, but it's not really impacting us very well and we're not able to discern what their points are, and if we are able to discern what their points are, we're not able to tell why that's an effective point, why it's correct, why that argument works, why it doesn't work, things like that. And the reason for this, obviously, is as James noted, we're not slow to speak, we're quick to speak. We want to get in our words as opposed to allow them to bury themselves if they're wrong, or present themselves if they're right. And of course, anger, the emotion of blocked goals, can also stir up this mental blockade that basically defines most of social media, and one that we need to avoid if we're going to be effective at rhetoric as well. Absolutely. So uh, if we hear something that we don't like, we tend to turn off our minds and, like you said, Sean, resort to anger and just think about our response as opposed to continue listening to what the person's saying. We're not waiting our turn, we're listening to the answer. That's right. Oftentimes, uh, I'll give sermons and people come up to me and be like, I can't believe you said that. I'm like, well, yeah, but I followed it up with this. Well, they didn't hear the this, they only heard the beginning of it, and their brains turned off, and they, they couldn't hear the end. Uh, I, I think it was Chuck Smith, he gave the illustration where a pastor stood up on Easter Sunday and said, you know, God is, God is dead, God doesn't exist, or something to that effect. They found evidence of Jesus' tomb, and the body was in it. It turns out that the whole resurrection was a fraud, and everything that we are gathering here for is based on a lie. It's been verified historically, you all can just go home. Next word, next breath. Wouldn't it be awful if that was true? Right. Then went on to <laughs> give the message, and of course, a lady came up to him. This was him, right. literally, afterwards, and said, I can't believe you would say those things. He's like, do you hear more than the first 12 seconds, woman? <laughs> That's my 
summary. But Absolutely. <laughs> and we have total tendency to do that. And uh, we do that with our opponents. We do that with people that we don't like. We, as I said, we hear their point. We, we're listening passively, but we're not listening actively. So we can't actually interact with what they're saying. And therefore, the conversation usually devolves to name calling and things like that, which we'll talk about more. Yeah, and again, <laughs> yeah. it's not always a bad thing to tune someone out if they've demonstrated themselves to be untrustworthy or taking a verifiably false position. You don't do them any favors by entertaining or wasting your time in engaging with an issue you already know is being false. Right. So, and again, you can talk about this in the terms of public debate or an outreach. If someone's coming to you and explain the glory of Luciferianism. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay too much attention. You can just pick one topic and say, well, let's focus more on that because I'm pretty sure everything else involved human sacrifice. Yeah. Let's just get on to the more important issues. Absolutely. And in the coming weeks, me and Sean are going to be teaching various logical fallacies that you can start listening for. Mm -hmm. So you can understand what they are, why they are fallacies, and how to interact with them. How do you steer the conversation in a different direction? Jesus was a master at this, by the way. So whenever he spoke to people, People, you notice, especially his opponents, he never answers their question. Now, that seems infuriating. You're like, why don't you just answer the question? Because the question itself is a trap. Jesus sees the logical fallacy, and he's able to skirt around it. So absolutely, Jesus is God. He is wise. But it doesn't mean what he's doing is completely foreign. It's not miraculous. It is just a source of divine wisdom. Jesus is able to spot fallacies because he's God, <laughs> kind, of his, kind of his thing. He's able to spot fallacies very well, and he's able to respond to them in a way that doesn't snap the trap closed around his leg. And since our goal here is in the Bible, first and foremost, we'll be giving biblical examples when these fallacies are either presented or addressed. Absolutely. So uh, one thing that I wanted to talk about today, though, in regards to listening, normally this would be like lesson one. If you're learning rhetoric, this would be lesson one. But we kind of have to go back to like lesson negative one in our culture because rhetoric is fundamentally presupposed on a foundation of objective truth. So in order for rhetoric to be utilized or a useful tool, dialectic and rhetoric, you have to believe that there are objective truths that underpin the world and that your brain is actually designed to be able to perceive those objective truths. So, for instance, if I right now held up my Bible, so those of you guys who are listening, you're going to have to use your imaginations. <laughs> but those of you guys who are watching, you can see this. I'm holding up my Bible, and if I say, do you see a Bible, I'm presupposing that you have A, eyeballs that are able to perceive the Bible, and B, a brain that is able to adequately translate the information from your eyes to something that resembles a Bible. I believe in objective truths if I ask a question like that. Rhetoric presupposes that there are objective truths and that those objective truths can be discovered by the human brain. So if either one of those are out of sync in my way of thinking, I will not resort to rhetoric. So if I don't think that there are objective truths, why would I have a conversation with you about truth when you and I might have different perceptions of truth? You have your truth, I have my truth, and we revert, resort to uh, revert back to Pontius Pilate when he asked Jesus, quid es veritas, what is truth? One of the most famous questions in all of scripture. When Pilate is saying that, he's not asking Jesus, he's not like, Man, what is truth? I, I, I really don't know. No, he just told him. That's right. Jesus just told him. He's dismissing Jesus' claims by saying there is, in other words, it's there is no truth. There is no truth. There's your truth. There's my truth. There's all those people's truths out there. They think you're a liar. You think you're a king. I think you're a madman. Who cares? It's all just perspective. That was his view of truth. Which you can't. Yeah, which is why the predominant philosophy of this age has removed the need for rhetoric, because it's also dismissed the idea of truth. Philosophies mm -hmm. like Feuerbach and Nietzsche have dismissed this idea of an absolute foundation for reality, and now we're seeing the consequences. Welcome to the internet. That's right. So if you ever wondered, you know, why is debate so foreign nowadays? Why doesn't it happen more often? And when you go online, why is it that... Uh, these online, so there's multiple reasons, but what, what is one of the reasons why these online civil discourses become so inflammatory, so inflammatory so quickly is because people today have more or less dis dismissed the idea of objective truth. And therefore, what's the point of debate? Even in fact, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this right now, when we got into these rhetoric classes, you might have been like, 
what's the point, Peter? I mean, you guys got your point of view. Other people got their point of view. We all just kind of argue about it. And are we any closer to knowing the truth? You know, I mean, what's the point of listening to debate? You're buying into that line of reasoning that's pervasive in our culture, that there really is no objective truth. There's a great proverb. It says, a man seems right until his, until his neighbor comes and cross-examines him. So when you hear people debate and you hear people speak, you get to hear the other side, and that contrast brings about clarity. It helps you understand the issue a little bit better. And because you have a reasoning mind created by God, who is a reasoning God, the laws of logic are not subjective. They're objective. They exist whether we recognize them or not. The human brain is not here to create truth. The human brain is there to recognize truth, and God has designed us to be able to do that. Think again about how God has delineated truth. He's delineated truth through the Bible, and the Bible is not just a set or series of doctrinal statements. I don't know how many of you guys have actually read the doctrinal statements of the church, like the creeds and things like that. They're very succinct, they're very easy to follow, and they're just very concrete. And some people, like Muslims, for instance, are a good example. They're like, well, if the Nicene Creed is so clear in Scripture, why isn't there a clear Scripture that says it? Well, the elements that make up our doctrine of the Trinity are present in the Bible, but you got to use your noggin to be able to put the pieces together. And once you use your intellect and reason to a certain extent, it's an inescapable conclusion. You can't say, well, there are some people who read the Bible and they don't see the Trinity in there. That's great. That doesn't mean the Trinity is not in there. It just means that they're not seeing it. Just like if I'm talking to my dad, who's unfortunately colorblind, just because he can't see the color blue doesn't mean it doesn't exist, right? It just means that he can't perceive it with his eyes because there's something wrong with it. There are objective truths, and the human brain has been designed to discover those truths by God. So in order to give a cool example of this, I'll play this. And hopefully it picks up on the microphone. Let us we'll know if you can't. It. We'll repeat it. Me and Sean will interact with this a little bit. This comes from a documentary called What is a Woman? And if you haven't watched it, regardless of where you stand on gender ideology and things like that, I would encourage you to watch it because the beginning of the documentary is all rhetoric. So the person is uh, presenting himself as someone seeking answers. And so he spends the first 45 minutes just asking questions. It's not gotcha journalism. <clears throat> he lets them bury themselves. That's right. He lets them speak. And so if you want an example of how to listen, how to ask appropriate questions, I think this is actually a very good way to get there. But this is a conversation that he has with a liberal professor. And listen to his response. I think it's very telling of where our culture is at. Says that they're a woman or they're a man, then that's them telling you their gender is. I, I'm not so sure why, what social um, in, interactions would have to do with with maleness or femaleness. That would. Well, be I, I'm not even talking about social context. I'm just I'm just trying to start by getting to the truth. You know. Yeah, I mean, I'm really <laughs> uncomfortable with that language of like getting to the truth again in social why, why life. Is that, why is that uncomfortable? Because that, it sounds actually deeply transphobic to me, um, and, truth, and, and if you keep probing, we're going to stop the interview. I, if I probe about what the truth is? You keep invoking the word truth, which is condescending and rude. I'm saying was, to you... How is the word truth condescending and rude? Why don't you tell me what your truth is, and you're walking on 30 seconds more of the nights before I get up. Oh, boy. My truth is what? All right. So that uh, I hope you guys were able to listen to that. But that is a very interesting dialogue. I think it's very telling of the age that we live in. But essentially, if you guys couldn't hear it, he is interviewing this professor. And the professor is giving this long-winded answer about how he sees reality and how we should perceive pronouns of an individual. And the question is, well, I'm not really interested in social interactions. I'm interested in truth. And how does the professor respond to that? And how is that telling for our day? Well, instead of addressing his perspective or clarifying it in light of the question, they got defensive and they, of course, put themselves in the victim status, which is basically how all conversation online goes, in order to achieve a moral high ground and gain emotional empathy rather than to have some sort of accountability for which, their ideas. What part of rhetoric is that? The ethos, right? Yep. So presenting the ethos, the ethics of the speaker to basically say, I am an ethical person, so therefore you should believe what I'm saying. 
and ethical standing is achieved in our culture through victim status. As opposed to, and unfortunately at the expense of Laogos, which is what Walsh was trying to invoke. That's right. Because how can you have an argument that has Logos when you've ejected the concept of truth? And notice that at the end of the conversation, when he gets very upset with him for invoking this word truth, he calls it bigoted, he calls it transphobic to even say that word. As and if that he, word means something. Right. And then he, which again, how do you define these words, right? So uh, at the end, he says, well, why don't you tell me what your truth is? And that's how that answer. So you see it implicit in his comment that he does not believe that there are objective truths. So if I'm talking to someone who's communicating that way, I am not going to get anywhere with this person until we can come to a, a mutual understanding of objective truths. Which we'll talk about more when we get to self-defeating ideas. That's right. So when you think about language, uh, some people who believe in subjective truth today, they will say, well, you know, language is malleable. It evolves over time, so therefore it doesn't really matter. And there's a, there's a hint of truth in there, but it's, it's covering a pretty big deception. Yeah. So what they're hinting at is because phrases change, the meaning of words change over time, therefore language is malleable and it doesn't represent any type of objective reality. Now that's untrue. What language does is obviously, again, using the example of the Bible, there are many different words that I could use to describe this. I could call it a book. I call it a Bible. I can invoke different languages and their word for Bible, their word for book. And all of these words would be true, even though they're all different. The point is, is even though language is malleable, the language itself is present to be able to describe something that's objective. In other words, how do you and I share an experience collectively or together when it's both being perceived in different ways and at different points of view? Well, we use language. We try to bridge the gap of perception by communicating to each other in words that we both understand and we both have clear definitions for. So the problem is, is that in our culture, because truth is subjective, the main guy who really messed this up was a guy named Michel Foucault, uh, lived about 56 years ago. He's kind of on the heels of these subjective thinkers like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and people like that. But Michel Foucault had this really interesting idea that since all truth is subjective, language is subjective, and language is actually an instrument of power wielded by those at the top to subject those underneath them. So he thought that language is just a power game and that those in power should actually, by having dominance, they need to actually steal language and make and change definitions. So when you see people where definitions are being changed on a daily basis and you're like, whoa, wait, where, where did this term come from? Where, where does this non-binary come from? Where does this Latinx come from? Where's, and if you find yourself constantly scratching your head and like, why don't I understand the words that you're saying? That is the point. The changing of the language is to create confusion and destabilize the capacity for intellectual dialogue. If I don't know what the words you're saying mean, I cannot reasonably interact with what you're saying. So. Uh, if you're, again, dealing with someone who is subjective in their ideology, you need to be able to address that subjectivity and you need to get that person to define their terms. So the reason why the movie is called What is a Woman is because he's just trying to ask very basic questions of, we have this word, we're both using it, but I get the idea that you and I mean something very different when we're utilizing this word. So let's get down to brass tacks. This is also a very useful tool when we're talking about evangelism. And evangelism, especially with Mormons, this is like one of the main groups of people that I was speaking with that I realized the necessity of this lesson, where we were using the same language, but I realized very quickly, we don't mean the same thing, right? So they would say, oh, yeah, we totally believe that we're saved by grace through Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah except for we're using terms, right? But they mean something. They don't mean what we mean when they say saved. They don't mean what we mean when we say grace. And they don't mean what we mean when we say Jesus Christ. They mean something totally different on all three of those key terms that make up that sentence. So in order for me to communicate with this person, I have to figure out what do you mean by saved? What do you mean by grace? What do you mean by Jesus? And then we could get down to what our disagreement actually is. Uh, when it comes to even marriage sometimes, the way that men and women communicate oftentimes is very different. 
We have different ways of communicating emotion. We have different ways of communicating how we feel. Sometimes it's even just nonverbal, and we expect our partner to pick up on cues. One exercise that I give for couples that are having difficulty communicating is I tell them, first of all, try this. It's I don't have a fancy name for it, but it's basically a cross-examination tool. So instead of you guys just arguing, give five minutes, and during that five minutes, only one person can talk, and all the other person can do is ask questions, right? So you can't, and not leading questions, not like, well, that's, why do you think that I don't understand what you're saying? You know, like it's just- Yeah, like a Jeopardy manipulation. Right. <laughs> what is, <laughs> yeah. you're an idiot. <laughs> it, it's, it's actual clarifying questions. What do you mean by that? I'm trying to understand. At the end of that five minutes, what I tell the couple to do is I say, okay, the person on the receiving end of the cross-examination, meaning the person asking the questions, not making the statements, you have to repeat back what you heard your partner say to their liking. So in other words, once they're done speaking, I have to then communicate to them, this is what I think you're saying. And if you're wrong, your partner can correct you, and they keep correcting you until you get it right. Oftentimes, what you see happen in communication breakdowns in relationship is we're speaking the same language, but we're really not. We're using the same words, but we mean very different things. So this is a big, big key of re uh, rhetoric. You're going to have to do it in dialectic, meaning when you communicate with people in a verbal way, in a dialogue way, but also be open to it when you hear rhetoric itself, when you hear politicians speak, when you hear your pastor speak. What does he mean by these words? Part of my journey in Christianity is recognizing that uh, when I was around 22, I was like, oh, man, I don't understand what a lot of these words mean. I don't know what salvation means. I couldn't define it in a really clear and concise way. I don't, I don't know what the word grace means. And that's, that's my fault, because I was just kind of slipstreaming on other people when they were doing the God talk and just pretending like I didn't know what they meant. But I realized I need to do some homework and really figure these things out if I'm going to adequately understand what my pastor is teaching me and allow those words to move me in a way that God wants. So remember, it's not that the pathos, the emotional part of the argument, or the ethos, the ethical part of the argument are bad, but they're like the bread and the condiments on a sandwich. They're good, but without the meat, it's just bread and lettuce. You, know, you got to have something full there. The logos, the logical argument, that's the meat. But if you just got the meat, that's boring. You know, so the, the pathos and the ethos, they're good. They elevate the argument. They enable the argument to touch you at a deeper place, to move you experientially. So they're good. We shouldn't dispose of them, but we should also train ourselves to listen for the logical argument and interact with it. And understand that's what's key. If you're listening to someone and they don't actually tell you what they mean, they're either trying to manipulate you or they're not being clear. This is why you ask for clarification. And again, being slow to anger does not mean that anger is not eventually warranted. Right. If someone's deliberately lying to you, that is indeed something to respond to as an injustice. But if, on the other hand, we're not quick to speak, but or quick to listen, but quick to speak, we're violating what James laid out for us in the foundations of rhetoric, which again, to recap what's been discussed, the foundation of a good listener is knowing what to listen for. Mm. The listening for needs to be first understood as the foundation of truth, that there is such a thing that applies to both of us at the same time right. and in the same way. And without that authority, there's nothing to listen to because nothing ultimately is being said. But once that agreement is then formed, we look for logos, the logic, the definition. We understand the logos in light of the ethos and the pathos, and then we come to conclusions, but not before. Mm. If someone can tell you fun stories, they haven't actually told you anything. <laughs> if someone describes something a certain way, they still have to tell you what that thing is they're describing. Right. And of course, if someone just gives you a list of facts, well, then you probably respond to them the way you do with us and think they're boring, but we're doing our best here. So... <laughs> Listening. Understand truth, understand logic, understand illustrations and the differences between, and that, of course, is founded in truth. If we can have those conversations, then we're talking. But if not, well, then you can spend your time elsewhere.